Welcome to WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast series by Pharma Voice. This episode was made possible by a generous sponsorship by Purohit Navigation. For more information, visit purohitnavigation.com. In this episode, Taryn Grom, Editor-in-Chief of Pharma Voice Magazine, meets with Peyton Howell, Executive VP and Chief Commercial and Strategy Officer at ParXL. Peyton, welcome to the Pharma Voice Wild Podcast Program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. And congratulations again on being named a 2019 Pharma Voice 100. Thank you so much. It's a great event, and I'm delighted to be included. Over your 25-year career, you have been intimately involved in everything patient. It's been remarkable, the things you have done. Um, Let's start with your founding of the Lash Group and work our way through to your current role as Executive VP and Chief Commercial and Strategy Officer at PowerXL. So let's start with what led you to become an entrepreneur? Well, it is kind of an interesting story. I mean, I think you often become an entrepreneur just simply because you're open to it, and I think that was the case for me. I was actually approached um, to join a, a part of a very small set of founders for our Blash Group, which was a boutique consultancy originally focused on hospital consultancy, while I was actually working at what was then Arthur Anderson, so in the consulting space. I had met a number of these uh, folks from my time in hospital administration at Ohio State, and it was one of those calls that you get where it makes absolutely zero financial sense to join, especially given I was very young in my career, and my husband was at that time going to grad school himself, um, but it just felt like the right thing to do. Um, they were aware of, of this kind of new area that I was focused on called reimbursement. And at the time, that was just not a word people understood, you know, <laughs> policy and reimbursement issues. Um, and I was really doing that in the early 1990s, um, you know, so before it was cool, you could say, both for <laughs> hospitals and for physicians. And I think, uh, you know, when they approached me to join them, um, it was one of those opportunities to, you know, be a partner, be a founder. So I obviously changed my career from that perspective. It just felt right, and I felt open to it. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a number of entrepreneurs in my family, my father, my grandfather, but all in different areas, not in healthcare. Um, and so I think that made me open to that idea, and I'm, I'm grateful because uh, it certainly gave me a chance to take that area I was working on and then begin to, to focus on that first generation of reimbursement support and patient assistance programs through the early 1990s that really were part of the transition of biologics coming to market and being accessible in your community, at your community physician's office, um, in your community hospital setting, but mostly in the outpatient setting. And it's hard to imagine just, you know, actually not that long ago, right, that 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 wasn't an option for folks. And when you think of our treatments that we have available now, particularly in areas like oncology, um, it really has changed how we're able to access those life-saving treatments. So definitely grateful for that. Um, but it was growing fast. Uh, Lash Group was a fast group, growing business uh, quickly, and I learned the lesson very quickly that while successful and growing, I needed working capital. So it was clear that we were going to need uh, more than my American Express card could take from a growth <laughs> perspective. Um, and I was fortunate that we were actually approached very quickly in terms of interest uh, you know, to buy the company. And Amerisource Bergen um, acquired the company. There were others uh, that were interested as well. So I had the you know, delight of being able to kind of choose that, that, that desti- destination, if you will. Um, and that was also important because I was joining a group that really didn't have anything like what we were building and were re- intrigued by the innovation, saw the opportunity, um, but were also going to let me just continue to incubate and grow. It was at that point a fairly young business of just 200 or so, 250 type employees, you know, now I think that division is, you know, upwards of 5,000. So I think it was really important to be able to be at that right destination. And then they obviously gave me an opportunity over time to be able to acquire other businesses um, as part of, you know, growing into my role at a large publicly held company. And that was certainly a gift in and of itself as well. Yeah, talk to me about some of those lessons that you learned along the way. You know, you started off with your vision, and then you had to the great opportunity to join a big publicly held company. How was that transition for you? Yeah, it was a tough transition, actually. I, I learned very quickly, both in a privately held company as well as in a publicly held company and in being part of a much larger company, the importance of per- performance capital. 
And I think particularly as women leaders, it's important for us to identify metrics and not be afraid of of those metrics. So even when we were starting those first reimbursement support programs, we were separately tracking uh, their viability, their profitability, and that's critical when you're growing and obviously incurring a lot of expenses just as part of growth, you know, to be able to do that. And it felt risky at the time, right? It felt like, you know, I was, you know, in some ways exposing um, that process, but it was a great lesson for me that I took with me because, you know, when you can identify your performance, particularly as a woman leader, that's the discussion that you can have to continue to advance your career. You know, that's the discussion you want to have related to advancing and the next opportunity and, frankly, your value to any company. But if you're not willing to talk about it from a performance basis, you're not going to be really standing on two feet. And the same exercise is what I've done is we've acquired other businesses. So we looked at really what were those performance you know, expectations we had and how could we then align rewards for any incoming company associated with that. And I think that's honestly been critical because then you're doing what's going to make the business sustainable. You know, how do you make a business that's built for sustained growth and by making sure you honor what's important for that business success and for the people that you need to continue to develop their career um, at that entity. And, and I certainly have taken that with me every day. Um, I act as a founder and an owner, right, no matter if I'm really an owner or not, right? I think that employee mindset of being an owner is actually a really exciting mindset of how you invest every dollar, how you spend every dollar. It's just like if you own the company is a great way to lead, you know, overall. I think that's a fabulous um, insight. Thank you so much for sharing it. I haven't ever heard it put that way in terms of performance capital. So what a great um, punctuation point. Thank you. Well, it is. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of times when you look at why do so many acquisitions fail, right? So Lash Group thrived. Why do, you know, why do all the acquisitions we have at Park sell? Why am I focused on their success? Well, most fail, and that's because you don't pay attention to those things. And I think sometimes you forget the reason you've acquired a business. You usually have acquired a business because you want to incubate innovation and accelerate innovation in a larger business. And I think you know, we lose sight of that sometimes as we bring businesses in. We focus on, you know, cost cutting and integrating to make them the same as the mothership versus how can we learn something from this small incubator of success. And I, when I think about the types of exciting technology businesses that exist nowadays, it's even more important, right, that you instead learn from those small, agile, nimble businesses and, and leverage that into our larger organizations so that we do stay fresh and new. I couldn't agree with you more. We hear that all the time from the folks that work in the biotech sector. They get purchased because of, as you said, their agility, their innovation, mm -hmm. and then the purchasing company wants to amalgamate them is the same as the, owner, as the owned company. So you lose that kind of edge if you don't yep. allow them to be true to their mission. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. Excellent. So now you are in the C-suite at one of the largest global biopharmaceutical companies in the world. Talk to me about what your current role is and what are your near-term and longer-term goals for the company? Well, thank you. Yes, I've been at Par Excel as Chief Commercial and Strategy Officer for almost a year and a half. Um, it's been incredibly exciting uh, to be in, in, on this side, um, coming from the commercial side of pharmaceuticals into the drug development side. And my role includes strategy, so that includes M&A. It also includes marketing and communications, our sales and business development team. And then it also includes something that echoes my roots, which is all of our consulting services. And at Par Excel, we have a very robust portfolio of consulting services, including regulatory consulting, where we're very well known and established with about 1,000 regulatory consultants around the world, but also access consulting, market access, and also some strategic consulting, particularly we made a recent acquisition called Health Advances that's part of that portfolio. So it's a portfolio of consulting services businesses, and you know, the opportunity that I have in my role is to bring that consultative approach to everything that we're bringing to our customers from a sales and business development perspective. And it's been really, really exciting. In the near term, we've been, we've been busy. Um, in this year and a half, we've actually implemented a new corporate strategy that's focused on the patient, and we've done a complete brand refresh for ParXL, obviously advanced the leadership team quite a bit. Um, so there's you know, a lot that we've done, but of course, as you might imagine, there's a lot to do. Um, certainly longer term, my, my goal is to really have ParXL be the market leader in terms of both growth, but focused on innovation 
in clinical research and drug development and hopefully really being identified as the CRO that's really focused on the patient and patient access. It's a huge remit, Peyton. I don't know, how do you manage all of that? Because I just heard you list off all the areas of focus that you're responsible for, plus 2,000 people or 20,000 people across the world. How do you manage that on a day-to-day basis? Well, I'm not the CEO, so the product sells more than 20,000. They don't all report in through me, but um, obviously, like any good leader, um, you know, it's really all about having a great leadership team. And I've just really been humbled, frankly, by um, the breadth and depth of capabilities that exist in this part of the pharmaceutical industry. It's, it's really been amazing. And at the end of the day, I feel like my job is to make sure we have that leadership team in place um, and really be able to you know, address the challenges that they face every day. So I need to be the problem solver or clearing out those obstacles. I think the new challenge for me is this is a much more global company. Of those 20,000 employees at Parkcell, over 8,000 are in the Asia-Pacific region where we have a very long, rich history. I think we've been in China over 20 years, in Japan over 25 years. And I was just in both of those areas last week. And, you know, there's so much energy and capabilities in our organization in some of those regions. So that's been exciting for me. But it has meant that it's a good thing I don't need a lot of sleep because we have (laughs) to honor everyone's clock. So I do find we're working uh, early and late in order to accommodate, you know, my, my colleagues around the world and make sure that we can all stay connected. Yeah, that's a big job to do, especially globally, as you said, because it's a 24-hour cycle. So kudos to you for figuring it out. I, I'm intrigued by the bridge that you can build between commercial and drug development. How are you finding that? Because you can bring so many insights from your commercial background now to the drug development piece of it. And I think there is a clear intersection as we go forward in the future and in, in making those two areas less distinct, and more synergistic? You are spot on. That is a great question. And honestly, it's part of what brought me to Par Excel is I've always been on that other side and been just frankly given the evidence that was part of the regulatory approval of a product, and then now you need to go fix it, right, in terms of trying to figure out how do we actually get this product reimbursed so patients that need it can get access to it. So I see regulatory approval really as just the first hurdle and what I'm trying to bring uh, to Parkcell is that experience and that patient focus that in those early days of protocol development, we're thinking about this broader range of evidence about what evidence and, and outcomes are we going to really need to support patient coverage and appropriate reimbursement of that product around the world. Because anything we can do to bring that value message and that evidence forward in the drug approval process, at the end of the day, is actually going to reduce costs in the system and help the right patients get access to that product more quickly, um, and hopefully at an affordable you know, amount too, which is critical in terms of affordability for patients. Absolutely. Um, speaking of patient-first focus, you, were, you launched one of the first patient access and reimbursement programs, as you talked about, the R word, um, at LASH. How has that changed to some of the programs you're developing today in terms of patient access and reimbursement? You know, those first um, patient assistance and reimbursement support programs really have been a great lesson for me in terms of the importance of really following the patient journey and where the pain points are for patients and also for for healthcare providers, so investigators in my world, and I used to call them providers, um, you know, both of those pieces, when you follow that journey, you do find a lot of the answers. And in those early days of reimbursement support programs, we went from really a lot of the pharma companies were giving away free drug. They even called the programs like indigent support programs and things that when we think about today just sound terrible. And instead, started saying, how do we actually help that patient get access to the health insurance that they need? How do we help them apply for Medicaid, for example, or some of the expanded access type programs? How do we help them navigate their private insurance and prior authorization process and all of those barriers? And I've been able to apply that same type of lesson to the patient journey that we have as part of clinical trials. One thing that we're doing as part of a patient innovation center that we've launched is really bring in a patient advisory board and map out protocols against what the patient experience is going to be. And a lot of times there's data that we'd love to have, right, as part of a clinical trial, but it might mean the patient needs to be on site at a physician office for 17 hours, so that's not realistic. 
We really, we really have to step right. back and say, how can we make this something that patients can actually be part of that's workable for patients um, and that's something that they can stay engaged as part of that clinical trial so we don't lose them in the process. And that's the same lessons that I had from doing those early patient assistance and reimbursement support programs is follow the patient and obviously make sure you're sensitive to the needs of their physicians and healthcare providers as part of that. Fabulous. Are you also seeing an uptick in specialty pharma and orphan drugs in terms of this approach? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's important that we look at all of those pieces. I probably get a question a day about someone looking at specialty pharmacy and hub type programs and wondering how can we tap into that as part of drug development because there's a natural connection there. A lot of the specialty pharmacies are frankly working with the patients that we need to be part of clinical trials. So there's a real opportunity, and we're still early in that, but there's a real opportunity with some of the things that we're calling virtual trials, for example, or decentralized trials. And I'm not sure I love either of those descriptions because they're not perfect, but what it really means is meeting the patient where they're at as much as, pro- as possible in order to minimize the burden of being part of a clinical trial. It also means finding the patient in the community so that patients that normally would never even hear about a clinical trial can actually be part of those advances and frankly have access to what often might be the only care option available to them. Awesome. Um, what are some of the other major trends that uh, you're tracking that will impact Paraxel in the near term and the longer term? Very good question. I mean, there lots of questions about the virtual trials that I just mentioned. Yeah. Um, after that, I would say the next hottest topic for us in particular in an area we're really investing in is the use of real-world evidence for, for more than market access, right? For the past 20 years, we've all been using that evidence to support that reimbursement side. But now we're working to try and really make that part of a regulatory approval. We're, we've termed the coin synthetic control arms, so basically using real-world evidence instead of a placebo control arm, as a way to be able to streamline clinical trials, but also to bring patient-centric clinical trials to market. And when you think about a lot of the rare orphan diseases and, and oncology, it's sometimes not even ethical, frankly, to have a placebo arm for some of those areas, or feasible in areas where there might be a limited patient number. So by using real-world evidence or applying real-world data to become real-world evidence, we're really creating some exciting new discussions with regulators around the world to leverage that into a new type of clinical trial, one that really will bring efficiencies and hopefully speed to market of life-saving treatments. It sounds exciting. Um, You know, let's talk about that a little bit more. So we're talking about patient outcomes, right, and how this gets integrated into the package for regulatory approval as well as for formulary adoption. What are some of the biggest barriers for this kind of data being applied in those circumstances? Yeah, there's, there is a lot of barriers. I mean, this is an area for us that we're investing in, and we really – think it's important for us to be at kind of the center of that, so being really neutral, if you will, in terms of where the data comes from and open to using and partnering with any of the data sources that are out there. Mm -hmm. We're focused on also creating ways to link that data. So one of the challenges has been, you know, how do you take different data sets and connect them? And so we're really working to try to create ways to use tokenization and other new technologies to connect both primary data sets and secondary data sets together. Usually, it takes that hybrid approach, meaning both those data sets from the secondary market as well as primary data, even as basic as some very basic collection of patient data, patient reported outcomes type data, and being able to combine those together. And that's been a challenge in the past. Before you really, people would just think about secondary data sets. We're trying to bring really our our approach in terms of using all of our knowledge across all of these different studies and combine that with some aspects of primary data to be able to best answer the question that a sponsor is trying to get to. And, and that's a novel approach. It's certainly challenging. Um, lots of different, different companies are out there, and it means we need to be open to partnering with lots of different companies. You know, not acquiring technologies as much as really being open to that type of partnership um, across the environment that you normally would think of in a Silicon Valley type activity is what we're really trying to bring to, to clinical research. That's exciting. Do you feel that because there are so many technologies out there that it causes 
difficulties for the folks who have to administer the clinical trials because they have to learn one technology from one you know, one company, another technology from another company. Is there a way to standardize the different technologies that are out there to make it easier for clinical research? Yes, there's a lot of work to do in that area, and we've been trying to be part of the solution um, as part of that. Um, obviously, we're, we're well known for actually being an early developer, a lot of those technologies. And, of course, there is a movement, there's a Transcelerate movement, um, yep. and certainly our customers are part of that. So we've been trying to be supportive you know, as part of that lesson. Um, and it's exciting, but it, it, it is at that tipping point where you can kind of feel that we're not quite at the destination yet, but we're seeing the benefits, and we're certainly needing to be open to leveraging any technology um, that a sponsor wants us to bring, which means we not only have to use technologies we've developed, but we also are partnering with all of the best-in-class technologies that we can find out there as well, um, which makes our job a little bit harder, but that's the right answer if it makes it easier for um, our customers and ultimately for investigators. Fantastic. It sounds like there are a lot of exciting things happening on the PowerXL front, and you are right there leading the way. So congratulations. Well, thank you. It's an exciting time. To switch tacks just a bit, I want to go back to some of the conversation we had at the start of our podcast, which was around performance data and women in leadership roles. As a woman sitting in a C-suite position at a major company serving the healthcare industry, you know that you don't have a lot of company up there, right? So you're a role model to many women. Can you share with us some of the skills you developed that helped you navigate to the C-suite? Yeah, we do need more women. There is still, it's still a gap. It's still lonely in the women's restroom many days, isn't it? Um, yes. You know, the, <laughs> the first thing is, uh, is certainly what I mentioned, which is the kind of performance-based or results focus. I think this is a, a real area of opportunity for women, and I think it's something we just can't shy away from. It's just focusing on our results as being the platform for how we have discussions uh, with, our, with our bosses. Uh, I do think managerial courage is something that I do think women can uniquely bring to the table. Um, it's an area over the years I've gotten feedback on as being a strength, you know, which, is, which is wonderful. It, it obviously can be a double-edged sword, sword for women, so I think we have to be honest about it, which means being vulnerable um, with that type of feedback and, and vulnerable you know, with the teams that we work with. And you know, as I've kind of grown in my career, um, I do think the skills that you need include you know, much more of that emotional intelligence, meaning just knowing who you are, being comfortable with that, and being frankly comfortable that you're going to make mistakes and be imperfect. And that's the opposite of how a lot of little girls are frankly raised in terms of being successful. There's much more of that perfection in all aspects and, you know, doing and looking, et cetera. And so we have to almost break that a little bit because leadership isn't perfect. Innovation is messy and you're going to make mistakes. So none of those fit kind of how often, you know, we as women might be raised, and we just have to break through that, and we can do that with the support of, of leaders, the support of our teams, and I certainly feel like I get more out of being, a, you know, a mentor. I get more from my mentees, and I actually give them because I think they really help push, you know, what would, it, what would you have wished you had known right earlier in your career, <laughs> which is always a tough question. Right, exactly. Let's talk about mentorship and, in some cases, sponsorship, which are two different things. Mentorship is that gentle guide sometimes, and sponsorship is really putting this, your, skin on the, your skin in the game for somebody. So does ParXL have a women's ERG that you're working with to help promote its women leaders? Yes, uh, we actually have incredible diversity and inclusion programs at Park Cell. I, d I wasn't aware of them before joining. We're, we're fortunate uh, to have a chief diversity officer and to be able to have developed over the years a number of programs for men and women and really addressing all types of diversity. But our Women's Leadership Initiative in particular um, has fantastic results, and it does actually create that formal mentoring type opportunity as well. Um, which is fantastic. I think on sponsorship, that is critical, and I think we all have to work, you know, harder on sponsorship. And I think as women, uh, we need to actually seek out sponsors, and they're going to—they're likely to be men. And I know for myself personally, without the sponsorship of the male executives that I've worked for over the years, it would have been very hard to have the opportunities that I've had today. And uh, you know, I think as women, it's okay for us to raise our hands and ask, ask for that support. Um, I actually shared recently at a women's conference that I had noticed that 
uh, many of the young men in my organization were reaching out and just simply putting time on my calendar uh, for one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and the women were asking for permission before they even bothered to do that. It was interesting because I realized, oh, my goodness, I'm actually mentoring more men than women at this point. How did that happen? And it was really just because they were a little bolder, and the women were looking for permission to do that. And as I started to share, don't ask for permission, you've got to say what you need, right? Seek it out. Um, you know, ask for support. Seek out leaders that you think could actually, whether it's as a mentor or as a sponsor, um, that you believe you can get to know. And someone can't be your sponsor if they haven't had a chance to really see you in action and know the results that you can deliver. Um, but we do, I think, as women, need to seek that out. And, and I also think we have to really you know, thank you know, the men that are, frankly, particularly in this day and age, willing to really take, spend time one-on-one -on -one with women early in their career. Um, when I hear some men and they publicly say they won't meet anymore with, you know, young women executives, I openly am saying there is no way I would be in the role I am today if the men I had worked for had said that to me and not been willing to meet with me, you know, at business dinners, bring me on client travel. There's absolutely no way to be successful with that, those types of opportunities early in your career. And I certainly salute the men that right now are, are taking leadership roles to make sure, you know, that we don't let politics and, frankly, bizarre fears interfe interfere with you know, men and women getting those types of opportunities early in their careers. I couldn't agree with you more. 100,000% said perfectly. Um, I love the boldness that you need to evoke if you're going to be a woman leader. You need to ask. You just need to show up sometimes. Right. It's not even about asking. Show up. Ask with, for what you want and go for it. That's right. Perfect. So, how would you describe your leadership style if you were forced to put in a short sentence? Yeah, I, I guess I would hope I'm described as someone who's authentic, um, that is direct and, and honest and accessible. Um, I think for me the best compliment I get is when, you know, someone, you know, in our company says, well, you're just so normal and just so real, right? Because that to me is the sign of a great leader, right, that you, they can bring any kind of challenge to you and feel like you'll be open um, to hearing their concerns and, and hopefully acting upon them as well as appropriate. You know, Peyton, you have a lot of strengths and a lot of capabilities and a lot of uh, really great insights, but you could have applied those to any other industry. Why did you choose healthcare? What's your passion driven by? Yeah, you know, it's funny, I've only always been interested in healthcare. Um, way back when, you know, just starting as a candy striper, you know, in high school, um, I've only been interested in healthcare. And, you know, for me, the passion and, you know, opportunity I'd be able to see is the difference that we can make in patients' lives. And, you know, when I think about diseases like HIV AIDS and cystic fibrosis, I have seen, you know, you know basically diseases everyone was dying from um, become treatable. I've seen life expectancies dramatically change. I've seen health outcomes in patients with multiple sclerosis dramatically improve. Um, and that is just such an honor and a blessing. And for me, it really makes it very easy to connect, you know, the why, um, the why you do what you do. So, you know, I feel like we're very lucky, all of us, to be part of this healthcare industry and certainly within pharmaceuticals in particular where we've been able to make such an incredible difference on patients' lives. Wonderfully stated. Speaking of successes, and we've had so many of them in the healthcare field, but how do you define success for yourself? Yeah, for me, success is definitely about growth. I'm a growth mindset leader, so when I see us growing, that means we're delighting our customers, which is first and foremost, you know, most important. That is, you know, how uh, customers, you know, select who they're going to be with, but it also means we're creating opportunities for our employees. So for me, growth is what, you know, really defines success, and that's why the long term, you know, my focus is going to be always to be a market-leading, growing company, and that's my goal here at ParXL. Fantastic. And finally, tell me about an accomplishment or a wow moment that shaped your career. Okay, those are hard. Um, <laughs> It, the, the one that really comes to mind for me um, was actually at Lash Group, there was a fork in the road moment where we had a, a customer with a brand new launch of a product with dramatic success, um, far more than what any of us um, had expected and certainly far more than we were staffed to accommodate. 
And because we were running reimbursement, it really meant that if we didn't respond to that overwhelming amount of incoming um, um, patient volume, that patients were going to be, de be delayed in access to treatment. And in this case, um, patients' lives could be impacted, actually. And so it's, you know, it's fairly urgent. And you know, I didn't honestly know exactly what to do. So you kind of go with your gut at that point. I rallied the entire group together. I remember we all, it was a stand-up meeting. We didn't have a room big enough to fit all of us. <laughs> and, and I was just completely vulnerable and honest that um, we were at a fork in the road for the company. And this is, we were going to either going to address this together and go on to be great, um, or we would fail and patients would be impacted. And I connected the why, you know, so people knew how we got here, right, now, which was, you know, obviously a positive problem, but a, pos a problem nonetheless, and, and what I needed, that I really needed us all to rally in ways that, you know, we, beyond what we all thought we could maybe even be capable of doing, and it would last for not days, but weeks, potentially months. And everyone really rallied. We knew why, um, and I, you know, that power of, of, you know, of why is so palpable, particularly when it's a patient. And it was an incredible lesson for me of just being vulnerable and honest and also then getting to see that there really is no limit to, to what a team, even a relatively small team, of people can do when they're working together towards a common goal and they know why and the difference that they can make. Thank you so much for sharing all of your stories, all of your insights, giving us a view to the future, um, not only in terms of clinical trials, but what PowerXL is looking to do. Um, this was a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast series. And thanks again to Purohit Navigation for sponsoring this episode. For more information, visit purohitnavigation.com. We also encourage you to listen to additional episodes at pharmavoice.com slash wow. This 2019 program is copyrighted by PharmaLinks, LLC.